welcome. Um, I'm super excited to be here. I'm, I'm crazy nervous, so just bear with me. I think like about five minutes in, I'll hopefully hit my stride and stop shaking a little bit, but you know, it happens to the best of us, so. Uh, day one was awesome. I love DevOps days. This is my maybe eighth or ninth DevOps days conference that I've been to. I really enjoy the open spaces and the collaboration and community, so I feel at, as at home as I can not being uh, an engineer. And as I mentioned, so a little bit nervous. This is actually my first keynote ever, uh, so bear with me. I know a room full of engineers, like totally not a judgy crowd at all, so I should be fine. Yeah, totally cool. Um, and before I kick off, I just want to give a shout out and thanks to so many people, I'm going to try not to get emotional, uh, who are so supportive and loving of me and, uh, you know, have helped me get to this place. So first and foremost, thank you. Uh, so again, I am Jill Jabinski, and I'm a recruiter, kind of. Uh, I fancy myself more of a people advocate, but we'll get into that a little bit later. So when I was brainstorming for this talk, I really wanted to hit on a topic that people ask me about a fair amount. So usually questions to me come in one of two camps. One is how to market yourself as an individual. Like how do you get recruiters or companies to notice you? And then on the flip side, how do you as a company or employer get those people into your organization and then get them to stay? So if you build it, they will come but will they stay was birthed so that I could talk about both sides of that equation. But before we jump into it a little bit too much, let's talk about me a little bit more so you can figure out why I'm here and why I have any authority to dispense information to y'all. So, as I mentioned, Jill Jabinski, uh, AKA at Jill Jobs on Twitter, hug dispenser. My background is uh, I got my master's in what's called industrial organizational psychology. What that basically is, is studying humans in the workplace. So that, that uh, schooling really helped me understand from a people perspective, when people react, have feelings, all of those kinds of things that humans do, uh, how, to, how to understand them at work. So in my tenure uh, career, I've worked at all sizes of organizations at varying stages in their growth, so it's really also given me an opportunity to have a very broad scope and pull data from. I, I can't influence everything or can't have control over everything, but what I can influence is onboarding, hiring, and culture. So from that, I've become incredibly passionate about making sure that people feel comfortable and at home within organizations. I want to, you know, whether that's through implementing best practices or procedures or spreading general happiness wherever I can. And I realize that that's kind of all the feels for some of y'all, but <laughs> Consider this, from uh, the Bureau of Labor tells us that we spend about 8.9 hours uh, a day at work. So to me, it's the job of an organization to create a great environment for their employees where they're comfortable and thriving, but it's also y'all's job to find and seek out organizations that have positive environments and work there and hold the negative environments accountable. Through my career, I, I got my start working at Rackspace, well, my tech career, um, working at Rackspace as a technical recruiter. I went on to DigitalOcean to lead recruiting there, and now I work at IBM via Blue Box Acquisition. So again, really, really broad scope and really seen, kind of seen it all. All right, so when we're talking about that ideal scenario that we want to create for our employees, we gotta figure out, like, what is the ideal? Well, to me, the ideal looks like this. It's a positive environment where employees can learn and grow, they're trusted, they kick ass at their job, and they're happier than pigs and shit. <laughs> a, a place where they can work hard but still enjoy themselves. And no, the slide is not a reference to Rackspace. <laughs> but, <laughs> but once I saw it, I knew I had to use that picture. So for this entire conversation, I'm gonna use this as the ideal, pigs and shit, for two reasons. One, because then I get to stand up here and say shit a lot, and that's fun for me. <laughs> and two, because there's no gender, race, background at all tied to this ridiculous scenario, so that's also important. All right, so another thing that's important to me from a personal and professional standpoint is goal setting. So in that vein, let's talk about 
what we hope to achieve during this session. Well, first and foremost, I'm gonna be up here talking a lot. So I'm hoping that I share some good insight with y'all. From that, I really want to kickstart conversation. So I don't want this to be a one and done type of session. Come find me in the hall, email me, ping me on Twitter, anything. Like, let's keep this conversation going. Um, and if you know me online or in person, you probably know or can tell now that I don't take life too seriously and I enjoy, you know, having some fun. So let's, let's keep that uh, going as well. And lastly, I really am hoping to create some actionable steps for y'all. We've all been to sessions where you're in it and you're jazzed and you're like, this is awesome, and you walk away and you're like, I have no idea how I would implement that in my day to day, and then it all goes away and you just go on with your life. I don't want that to happen now, so you know, keep that in mind. And then my number one goal always, uh, and I want, what I want for y'all is to give a shit. There's that word again. I want you guys to care about growing yourself as individuals, and I want employers to care about creating great environments for their humans. All right, and before we kind of fully jump in, I want you guys to keep in mind that some of these uh, processes and school of thought is a little bit different, and I know it can be scary, but just bear with me and hear me out. Okay, so here you are, you know, doing your DevOps thing on the day to day. There's some GitHub, some Slack, some cloud. I mean, this GitHub, I mean, this DevOps is using Jenkins. They're doing it. You're sitting online and you're on Twitter and you notice another individual is tweeting about having the job of a lifetime, getting a new opportunity, and you sit there thinking, you know, why can't I try something new? You see the tweet and you know the individual and you think, I'm just as good at automating tasks as that pig is. Why don't I have a rad new job? Well, you do what any good DevOps does and you chop, chalk it up to another case of recruiter ignorance. You go on with your day subtweeting about a random tire fire and you move on. <laughs> <laughs> but what if you could put yourself out there and see what happens and where would you even start? Well, as a candidate these days, I'm, I'm not looking at you just as a single note. You are an entity. And I know that sounds super self-important, and I love it, so we're gonna go with it. So I'm evaluating you on more than just a resume as a human. Uh, the four main areas that I focus on, and most recruiters do, is online brand, network, reputation, and skill set or resume. So it may not be a perfect pie chart, like your, uh, how, you, how you work out, but it's gonna be some varying degree. And some people won't have some of these things, and some people will. And, and that doesn't mean if you don't have one, you won't get a job, but frankly, it might make it a little bit more difficult. The online brand network and reputation are what I consider intangibles, meaning you're not gonna go to a career site and look at a job posting that says, I want someone with 3,000 Twitter followers who blogs about CICD and who follows all the key chef community members on GitHub. But those things might actually help you get a job. Because they are intangibles, I'm gonna really focus on those today. Two things before we jump in. Again, wanna reiterate, just because you don't have one of these doesn't mean you won't get a job, just might make it more difficult. And two, I know everyone hates recruiters, but so you might feel like having these will like be giving in to the man, but I assure you that's not the case. I know we all wanna be rebels, myself included, but this will help you. All right, so the first thing I wanna jump into is online brand. And I'm going to describe this very technically as what happens when someone Googles you. <laughs> All right, so I'm hoping my Wi-Fi kicked back on because I'm gonna do some crazy live demoing right now. Oh, nope, no I'm not. <laughs> All right, cool. So if you did Google my name, which is what it was gonna do, you would see, uh, obviously, uh, the Google page. What comes up first is my LinkedIn profile. And there's a lot of photos of me, um, one or many being of, of my dogs. Uh, so it's very obvious that I have cute dogs, more on that later. And then it shows a couple of blogs I put out, some podcasts, things like that. Um, so kind of what does this teach us when you're just Googling someone? Well, a few things. If you have content, put it up and put it out there. It's critically important. Two, maybe LinkedIn isn't so terrible. 
And I say that because it comes up even above image search. So because it's such a, a huge site, if you are really like adamantly opposed to getting messaged on LinkedIn, which I know a lot of y'all are, just turn off your messaging. Um, and then last, and y'all are missing out on some like cool stuff here because the last point is that nothing dies. And what happens if you Google me, if you go into images, <laughs> About six pictures in, there's a really horrific photo of me from about 2004, because it used to be my MySpace profile picture. <laughs> so <laughs> me and my best friend from college are looking really fly. Um, why did I just say fly? That is weird. <laughs> Don't add that to my vocabulary, Jill. OK. <laughs> but anyway, so yes, keep those things in mind. You know, Google yourself and see what's out there. Next is network. And this is your interaction with a particular community. So are you involved in conferences, meetups, online conversations about a certain aspect, tool, or methodology? So let's say as a recruiter, I'm looking for a Go developer. I might go to GitHub and look up Go and see who the, the core, um, core contributors are. Now, maybe for my company, it's not super critical to have a core contributor but I might see who's following those people on GitHub, or I might switch over to Twitter and see who they're interacting with so I can see kind of their broader network. The lesson here is that everybody needs a network. It's really gonna you know, be super important and helpful to you along the way. And it doesn't have to be in person, it can be online, so you don't even have to get off your couch. Although I'm fully supportive of you getting off your couch. Last is reputation. And to put it bluntly, it's what others would say about you. And I'm kind of using reputation and reference a little bit interchangeably because I don't mean to say that you have to be some kind of known entity to have one. Everyone has one. And this really goes hand in hand with network, obviously, because the more people who you interact with, the more people who can say things about you. That can be good or bad, but more on that later. All right, so let's have a look at how my process works so that you can see where these kind of things kind of fit in in action. This might not be every recruiter's process, and that's okay. Uh, usually recruiters do it to some extent, and it's applicable as well if you're directly applying to a role too, so this is not just like source candidates, uh, because at some point the recruiter and or people in the interview process will probably back channel you. All right, so first, it, the first step is sourcing. In my mind, it comes into three buckets, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, and my brain. So LinkedIn is obviously, I can do like keyword searching and things like that from location, skill set, et cetera. I know y'all hate LinkedIn, just bear with me. Um, Twitter, where a ton of uh, technical communities live, and then my brain, which through conferencing and Twitter and whatnot just has a large technical Rolodex. Then I get to do my favorite part. I get to stalk people. <laughs> super fun. So just like you're an individual that I'm considering going on a date with, I will stalk you. <laughs> Everybody does it. <laughs> um, so, you know, this typically involves heavy Googling, so online brand, things like that. Or I might uh, interact with some, some other humans and figure out who I should be connecting with. Maybe I know someone in that particular community, and so I ask if they know people looking for jobs or who I should talk to, et cetera. And then once I have done those two steps, I have a pretty good list of people that I want to reach out to. So I'll do this in a couple of different ways. One could be my preferred, which is email. Actually, my preference is probably Twitter at this point, let's be honest. Um, email or Twitter. And I mean, at the end of the day, I don't want to reach out to people on LinkedIn because it has such a stigma in tech. But if that's the only way I can communicate with you, then that's how I'll communicate with you. All right, so inevitably, I will reach out to you about a role that, and this is important, is actually applicable to you. <laughs> and then you'll, you'll wanna learn more, you'll come in, you'll interview, you'll obviously get the job, and we'll live happily ever after on my company's farm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah, cool story, Jill. But what does any of this mean to me as a DevOp? Well, it means that you need to be cognizant of your actions and create a well-rounded story of yourself. And here's some good ways to do that. First, put yourself out there. As I mentioned, it's, you want to be searchable, so blogging, things like that are great, and, and don't hold back. And it can also pivot into 
expanding your network too. So say you blog about something and it's of someone else's interest. So they might comment or reach out to you um, and you know, conversations flow from there. And I want to tangent for a second because when I'm saying network, like it seems really cold and ugly. Um, when I say network, I actually just mean friends. So one thing that's been great about this community and myself growing in it is that I have all of these you know, connections. I actually care about all of y'all as human beings and so it's, it's cool to expand that way as well. So it's not just like, what can I do for you? What can you do for me kind of stuff? But that, you know, that's a side perk. Next is be kind and, and helpful to others. I, I think a lot of people forget how often people in the industry talk to each other. So, and it's a lot. And so every action, like your tone, in interactions are going to be heard by someone else at some point. So be good to people. Next, don't burn bridges. Um, I know like in life, it's inevitable that you're gonna leave a job, you're gonna leave a relationship, a state, et cetera. But it's really important to create a group of supporters around you. In, in vain with the networking thing uh, and the, you know, a reputation. So just, just do your best to do that. Be yourself. Cookie cutter is super old school. And quite frankly, if a company doesn't want to accept you for who you are, then you probably don't want to accept that company for who they are. Be proud of your accomplishments. Um, I know that it can get, there's a fine line between like putting things out there and feeling like you're bragging about it, but knowledge sharing is not bragging. It's, it could be helpful to others. I mean, you could be helping someone else do their job, which is cool. Uh, one thing about a resume, make a non-boring resume. So, and don't get too crazy because I don't wanna see anything too, too insane. <laughs> but what I do on mine, so, uh, as we're pretending you know that I'm pretty Googleable. <laughs> Uh, if, if a recruiter or someone is just feeling particularly lazy and they don't want to Google my name, they can't, on the top of my resume, I just have three links, my three favorite things that I've done, either blogs or whatever, that, so they don't even have to think, it's just there. And then I do the typical, like, uh, bulleted list of, of kind of boring stuff. I mean, resumes are a little bit boring, let's be honest. But at the end, I have a, a short paragraph about myself, like my story. So, and, you know, in my tone, so you can get a little bit understanding of who I am just from reading it. And then last is find a connection and don't be afraid to. Uh, story I have about this, so I, when I got my, I keep picking up my water and not taking a drink, I have no idea why. Um, side note, <laughs> in case anyone else noticed, I also noticed. <laughs> um, so uh, before I got my job at Rackspace, I was working at a manufacturing company in San Antonio. I was an HR generalist there. I didn't know anything about Rackspace besides the fact that literally everybody in San Antonio wants to work at Rackspace. So I figured I should also want to work at Rackspace. <laughs> I had been there about at, at this manufacturing company and in San Antonio about a year and a half. And I had, let's call it, three friends <laughs> in San Antonio. So this is straight out of grad school. So I say that because I didn't have any connection whatsoever into Rackspace. But what I could do and what anyone can do is I looked up who the manager of recruiting was there. I reached out to him. I asked him for a phone call. We talked. He agreed to bring me in for an interview. And I got the job and the rest is kind of history. I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't done that. So don't be afraid to be proactive yourself. Like I know it can get frustrating when you're applying for roles and maybe not hearing back. That happens to all of us. But, you know, make your own path. And I think as a recruiter, if someone reaches out to me, I think that's very telling of, of their proactive nature, which is cool. All right, so now we've created a, a fantastic scenario. You have a rad new job. The company has a rad new employee. Everybody's happier than pigs and shit. But this is still the honeymoon phase. And you can still kind of smell that new car smell. But before you know it, you're going to be digging goldfish out of the backseat of the car. It happens to everyone. This is not throwing shade at any company, but it's the role then of an employer to figure out how to create a positive environment to keep people there. So let's talk about some, what I'm calling Jill science for a second. <laughs> how to create a baseline where you can uh, have content employees. So they're not gonna be like over the moon crazy for you, but they're not gonna leave because of these things. I find through my years of recruiting that candidates want three, need three things to be content cool shit to work on, 
and I, this is from a blog I did, so I think shit is just something I like in general. That was a weird thing to say also. Uh, <laughs> I'm really awkward if y'all didn't notice, too. Um, okay, so cool shit to work on, and that can, that can vary from person to person. Things that I think are cool, y'all probably don't think are cool at all, uh, and vice versa. Smart people to work with. Everybody wants a learning environment. And by um, learning, I don't mean that you necessarily have to work with all people who are more tenured than you, as I think that you can learn different things from people at varying stages in their career. Um, but you know, having that, that learning and thriving environment. And then fair pay. And frankly, I've never worked at a company that was top of the market. So I know it's intimidating to a lot of, a lot of employers thinking like, I can't pay as much as Google pays. Um, well, a lot of us can't, but that doesn't mean that you can't get top talent, because I've hired a lot of top talent at the companies that I've worked at. But what intrinsically a human being wants is to feel like they're not being undercut by the system. They want to feel like you are paying them what you can afford to pay them, and, and that it's fair. They just want to be treated fairly. All right, and it's important to note that these facts are not just privy to individuals who work at the company, these days, as you're interviewing, you know, um, the employee or potential employee is not the only one being back-channeled. Everybody's looking into companies of these days, too. So if you want to hire good humans and keep them at your company, you need to give them these things because it's inevitably going to filter out if you don't. Uh, fortunately for this talk, as we're back-channeling companies, they're also conveniently <laughs> made up of four things. They have online brands, network, and reputation as well that you know, we're uh, evaluating before, during, and after all interactions. In my opinion, the fourth piece for a company would be their product. So how do you get this information out to potential candidates without forcing it or feel like you're selling it and doing things like making your employees post positive reviews on Glassdoor, which is like just so tired at this point? Well, here's a, few, here's a few suggestions. Allow your employees to be open about what they work on. Now, I know different sectors have different rules and regulations about these things, but what happens when they can uh, talk about what they work on is that inevitably in at meetups, blogging, or in normal human interactions, they're just gonna talk about work, and it's gonna kind of grow from there. Encourage communities. And this means internal and external. So from an external perspective, if you want your employees speaking at meetups or conferences, if they have a talk accepted, maybe you could like give them time at work to work on it. Because as I know from building this, it takes a long time. So if you're wanting them to put themselves out there for you, you can kind of facilitate as well. Or if you want them to attend, try to back them financially if it's possible. Sometimes it's not, I understand that. Um, but another cool thing in a, a developmental opportunity is if you're sending someone to a conference and you know, they're representing your company, give them time when they come back to knowledge share with the team or the company so that they're going in like having a goal and like wanting to learn so that they can then show off what they've learned there. And it's a developmental opportunity for speaking to others. And then lastly, I oh, uh, forgot about internal communities. So internal communities are critically important as well. And I mean not just like the group that they work with, but the, you know, the overarching company. As I find that at some point, everybody's gonna go through hard times at work. They're gonna get stressed out. They're gonna be you know, working on a project that's taking so much time. But if you have a core group of people that you're really bonded with at work, it's going to highly impact their likelihood of staying at the company. All right, so now that we have the Jill science out of the way, let's get to some like actual science. <laughs> so that we can use proven data to see what makes employees happy at work once we've enticed them to work there, aka okay, how do we get them to stay? So keep in mind that as an employer, I want y'all thinking of this like full picture. So it's not just gonna be the environment that keeps people at work, it's not just gonna be the people or the money, it's gonna be how the work is set up as well. So job satisfaction is actually something that's been studied by psychologists since the 60s. And I say this because uh, the, with the, the timeline, there's a ton of data backing it. So it's not like the typical, what you think of like touchy-feely psychology. This is actual data-driven research. Some believe that job satisfaction is simply how content an employee is at work, um, while others believe that there's like multi-dimensional psychological responses to your job. It can get pretty hairy and complicated. So just 
Out of the many methods that are studied, I just want to talk about what's called the job characteristics model for a second. And it basically says that there are different job characteristics, so different core components of your work that are going to impact or be felt through psychological states which will impact job outcomes. So the uh, core components fall into three buckets. One is specifically about the role. So skill variety, meaning do you get to work on different types of things. Task identity, do you feel like you're working on something from start to finish? And then task significance, how much your work impacts other people's lives. Next is autonomy, so how independent you're allowed to feel. And then feedback, which is not only uh, feedback for yourself, which is important, but also feedback about the entire company and knowing results. So then they experience these through meaningfulness of your work, responsibility for your outcomes, and, and knowledge of the results. And this can determine people's motivation, performance, and satisfaction. Now, these are also moderated by a few things. So the skills and knowledge people come in to work with, the environment, some other things that, again, it gets hairy and more complex than we need to talk about here. But if anyone has questions, I'm, I'm happy to deep dive into it with y'all. So what does this tell us? Well, overall, I think that it tells us we need to understand our workers and, I don't know, treat our employees like human beings. And how do we do this? Well, you know, every employee is a complex little pig. <laughs> and we need to have managers that, key, have enough bandwidth to talk to your employees and understand what makes them them. Now, I'm not saying that you need to create a specialized environment for every employee. You know, that's just never going to happen. But if you know what makes your employee tick, you will know how to interact with them more effectively. You will learn how to deliver communication. And you'll help them succeed in their role. Also, ice cream helps. <laughs> All right, so how can employees utilize this knowledge to build an environment where employees are motivated, have high performance, and are satisfied with their role? I'm super glad you asked. The things that will greatly impact your employees and outcomes are communication. Having an open dialogue with your employees, as I talked about, so that you can understand who they are as humans and what makes them, well, them, will build trust, which will encourage employees to be creative, uh, promoting innovation, and that will drive growth. Not only for the company, but for the individual. And y'all should foster growth by uh, giving them access to training and development, which will help them be bought in and become leaders and be bought into leadership. So no matter how you split it, at the end of the day, a company is top down. So if you want people to be bought into the vision, you need to do this. Giving employees access to outcomes, wins, losses, goals, and feedback is critical, along with these other things, in creating a healthy environment full of employees that are unique, brilliant, creative, quirky, and ultimately, happier than pigs and shit. That's all.